Okay, so I'm not here today. So I'm recording this little video and it's going to talk about literature and whatnot. So, as you can see, we're talking about the literature of the Italian Renaissance. Where did the Italian Renaissance take place? That's right, Italy. Good. Okay, first we got to talk about our boy Petrarch. Pause. Boom. I fixed it. So now you can see the bottom. Anyway, Petrarch is the father of humanism. And basically, he's the guy that came along during the Renaissance. But they didn't call it the Renaissance then. And he was the guy that said, look, you know what sucked? The Middle Ages. Because they did not have all the awesome things that we have now. And by things, I mean an appreciation and love for classical learning and all kinds of awesome stuff like appreciating humans and you know really it wasn't even really the middle ages between you and me it was the dark ages so that's kinda of where that starts from the whole dark ages thing anyway he's the guy that says you gotta study the past in order to look to the future essentially he writes a number of things one of which is a thing called sonnets for Laura uh, Laura was this girl that he had a thing for, a crush on, but it was unrequited love. And what's neat about that is not like, oh, this guy was sad, but instead, like, this guy is capturing an essentially, essentially human feeling. And that is the feelings for someone who's never going to have feelings for you. This is a universal thing. Everyone has experienced this at some point, more than likely. And it's a human experience kind of thing. It's a universal hum human experience. I mean, it might just be like you and your cat, where like your cat will never love you as much as you love it. Or it might be, uh, you know, some lady you have in class, some young lady in class, or whatever. I don't know. I don't know your life. Here's this guy, Machiavelli. Machiavelli, as we already know, because we've already done an assignment on him, he writes The Prince, and essentially The Prince is a guide on how to govern a country properly. It's more complicated than this, but let's just go with this. Essentially, the goal is to teach aspiring rulers how to be good rulers. To do that, you need to be not a moral leader, not a good leader, not an immoral or evil leader, but you got to be able to say, look, whatever works for this situation is what I need to do. So amoral, see right there, amoral, without morals. You want to appear to be a religious man. You want to appear to be a good person and a fair and kind person. And in fact, if that's what works, do that. Hey, Sean. I had to pause it just now because somebody got paged for the main office. I was very disrespectful. Is this for tomorrow? This is for tomorrow, yeah. Jamari's in here. She's, she's right over there. So it's right there. She's right there. See? Okay. So anyway, it's an argument in favor of amoral government. I already said it. He also says the very famously quoted thing, it is better to be feared than loved. And in that, he means you need to keep your people in check you need to make sure that they don't feel like they can walk all over you. You don't want to be so cruel or evil that you're going to be, make your people of, like want to overthrow you and hate you. You just want to make them you know, respect you. Now here's the extra layer. A lot of people don't believe that Machiavelli really believed the stuff he wrote in the prints. It is a huge historical debate. There are all kinds of nerds online arguing about this at any given time. And the reason is, is because Machiavelli is essentially a Republican. You mean like Donald Trump? No, not like Donald Trump, although, well, I guess they'd agree on this one, that people should be able to vote. So yeah, like Donald Trump, but not like a Republican like the political party. I mean like a Republican like somebody who wanted a republic. Because you might recall, other Italian city-states had republics. So, Machiavelli, in writing The Prince, probably didn't really mean what he was saying. So then you go, well, is it meant to be satire, or was he just faking it? I personally, because I am also a history nerd, have an opinion on this, that he is trying to get in good 
with the rulers. He's lost his job. He wants a job to be an advisor, and he's like, look what I can do. I wrote a book. Because um, he's kissing up and telling them what they want to say, what they want to hear. Um, I don't know, though. Nobody knows. Problem is, Machiavelli, this squirrel-looking dude right here, he's dead. So nobody is going to be able to answer this question at all, and hence the debates. Nowadays, though, Machiavelli's name has become synonymous with being sneaky, uh, underhanded, you know, using whatever means necessary to acquire power. So even if the guy was being sarcastic or satirical, now his name means the thing that he hated. So you lose, Machiavelli. Bad news. How about this wizard-looking dude? Well, this is Lorenzo Valla, which always makes me think of Hala. So Lorenzo Valla. And Lorenzo Valla is a guy that is really interested in studying classical texts. And there was this classical text that was called um, the Donation of Constantine, wherein the Roman Emperor Constantine, who had converted to Christianity, gave a bunch of property to the church. Well, the problem is, Constantine didn't really write this. What Lorenzo Valla does is he takes this document that's supposedly written by Constantine and he analyzes it. And the, t the technical word for this is historical analysis or uh, critical literature study or whatever you want to call it. Or, or maybe it's textual criticism, Mr. Oliver, the thing that's on the screen right in front of you. <laughs> anyway, the point is he looks at this and he says, look, um, the donation to Constantine is not real. So he doesn't really put out like a, hey, guess what? popes of Rome, you all are a bunch of liars. I mean, it's definitely there. I mean, that implication by saying like, hey, I really feel like somebody forged this and at some point somebody was a liar, but he stopped short of getting kicked out of the church by offending the pope and saying like, it was you. So, uh, Lorenzo Falla is uh, somebody I might definitely know for the test. That's me winking in case the window is too small. That was me winking. Here. I feel weird when I'm winking because I'm just sitting in this room winking at a webcam and it feels weird. All right, how about that handsome feller right there? This is Castiglione. Okay, what country is he from? If you said anything other than Italy, you're wrong because we're talking about the Italian Renaissance. All of these guys are Italian. Anyway, he writes a book called The Courtier, and this is something we'll be playing with in my class later this week. Uh, essentially, The Courtier is a book that describes how ideally an ideal gentleman should behave. So, if you are an ideal gentleman, you should act a certain way, dress a certain way, know about certain things, be familiar with Greek and Roman stuff. So he has all of these things kind of laid out. The Courtier is actually a book in which they did a lot of these things back in the day where four different people are like walking around talking about what an ideal ruler would be like. And in it, they like one person will say like, well, I think blah, blah, blah. And this other person thinks blah, blah, blah. I'm going to pause it because Mr. Martinez is here. Say hi, Mr. Martinez. What's going on? How are you doing? All right. All right. So Mr. Martinez just came in, and he's, he says hi to all of you in case you couldn't hear him. Anyway, uh, the, the courtier is the book where these people are walking around. They're talking, and they're all like, well, I think the ideal ruler, or I, not the ideal courtier, and a courtier is just somebody who works within the court, who serves in the royal court. So it's going to be a rich person, probably noble, definitely noble, and it's going to be somebody who is like down with the king, and you got to have certain manners and stuff. It's like a manners book, but it's also got like, well, I think that he should be familiar with how to read and write Latin. Oh, what else, Castiglione? Well, I think he should be good at wrestling. And you're like. Wrestling? Like wrestling? Yeah. Well, actually, he didn't mean like professional wrestling or lucha libre as I'm wearing right now. Because this is the way I dress when you guys aren't in class. But he meant like wrestling as far as like you should be a manly man. You should be buff. You should have guns. 
you should be able to be super awesome. There is stuff in there about women as well, and it's problematic on multiple levels. Um, essentially, it was a super sexist time, as we've already talked about. So when I tell you that he said that women should, uh, that what they need to do is look pretty for their men, it's not going to shock you. Of course, it's terrible, very sexist, as I just said. But women were kind of like uh, ornaments. Uh, they were an accessory that you had on your arm in town. So if you want to look good, your wife's got to look good. So the Cast Castiglione uh, puts sections in there about like what a woman should do to be more attractive and things like that. And if there's any person that you should be taking advice from on how to be attractive, it's this fellow right here. Look at him. All right. The Northern Renaissance is going to be a little bit different than the Italian Renaissance. When you think of the Italian Renaissance, there are definitely religious themes, okay, obviously. Uh, but there are also a lot of things in there that are very secular. The Northern Renaissance is going to have some secular stuff, especially in subject matter of paintings, uh, but you're going to have a lot of literature, at least, that is not so secular, that's very much about education and reform, especially education on Christian ideals and the Bible and about reform of the Christian church. So let's take a look at this guy, Tommy Moore. Thomas Moore writes a book called Utopia. And in it, this book says, this is a perfect world, because that's one of the meanings of the word utopia, a perfect world. But it also means something else, which is kind of like a sad kind of thing. And that is, it means nowhere. So it's an ideal place that can never exist. And in this utopia, he describes this perfect society. And it is, everyone is equal. No, but there is no crime. Nobody wants anything because everyone's equal. And that's the problem, he says. This is a full-on criticism of society. He says, because you own stuff, that's the problem. Private property. Private property makes people greedy. Private property creates crime. So if we reform all the institutions to make it so everybody is equal and nobody is super rich and blah, 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 we have a perfect society. This might sound to some of you like communism or socialism, and you're definitely on the right track, but it's awfully early because Thomas More is writing in the 1500s, whereas Karl Marx and the socialists are in the 19th century, uh, the 1800s. So you could, if you want to be fancy, so fancy, that you, you could call Thomas More a proto-socialist, an early version of a socialist. Um, he, this will get him in trouble with his king, who will be Henry VIII. You might have heard of him, and we will talk about him in the next unit. Okay, I hope you guys can still hear me. They're doing all kinds of yard work outside, and it appears that they are actually like attacking and weed whacking and stuff right outside my door. So we're just going to pretend like I'm under siege. So anyway, Decedorus Erasmus, ladies, there he is, um, he writes in praise of folly. This guy is a super religious monk that criticizes the Catholic Church. And you're all like, but he's doing it because he loves the church so much. He's basically saying, look, guys, there are problems in our church. I know, right? Problems. And some of these problems are really bad. I mean, like, some people don't take priests seriously in town, and that's because some of them act really inappropriately. Some of them are getting drunk and visiting ladies who get to know them for a fee, if you know what I mean, and I think you do. And um, we need to stop with that nonsense. Now, he's not anti-Catholic by any means. He's a critic from within. Later on, we're going to have people who are really, really going to criticize the Catholic Church, and it's going to create a split within the Catholic Church. 
even more serious than the Great Schism, uh, where there was multiple popes. That was just a political thing for all intents and purposes. Uh, Martin Luther, it's going to come along in 1517, or chapter 13 in your book, and he is going to straight up say, like, yo, guys, Pope's not being real. And he's going to end up tearing the church apart and creating the Protestant religion. But more on that when we get to it. So I want to take a look at this, um, an excerpt from In Praise of Folly. Uh, it says, and next co these come that come those that commonly call themselves the religious and monks, religious and monks, most false in both titles, when a great when both a great part of them are farthest from religion, and no men swarm thicker in all places than themselves. Nor can I think of anything that could be more miserable did not I support them so many several ways. Okay, so he's saying like there are a lot of people who claim to be good people, claim to be religious people but they fake. They're not real about it. And he says when they swarm thicker in play, all places, there's, they're all over the place. They're everywhere, all these snakes. And the thing is, saddest thing, I supported them, man. In many ways, I support them all the time. He's a monk. So he's saying, look, there's all these fakes here. I'm, a, I'm the real deal, but there's so many fakes around me. So people think we're all on the same team. That's terrible. Okay, continuing. For whereas all men detest them to the height that they take it for ill luck to meet one of them by chance, for first they reckon it one of the main points of piety if they are so illiterate that they can't so much as read, and yet, like peasant fellows with all this vileness, ignorance, rudeness, and impudence, they represent to us, so they, or for so they call it, the lives of the apostles. If nothing else, by the way, take my poor reading of that excerpt as... Mr. Oliver also has trouble reading things from the past, even when he's read it many times before. So what that basically meant, the second part, was uh, people hate to run into these monks and priests who often are showing up to collect taxes for the church or a voluntary tax, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and he's saying these guys often can't read. They behave poorly. And then they say, these ignorant fellows who are supposed to be experts on the lives of Christ, they say like, uh, yeah, yeah, we are terrible people, but we're saying, if you want to be like the apostles that follow Jesus, that's us. And Decetus Erasmus is saying like, this is the worst. Education in the church, education in what the Bible actually is all about is what people need. So they understand that this is not legit, that you know, these guys are making me and the faith look bad. All right. How about Montaigne? Montaigne, de Montaigne develops the essay. So you're like, yes, we love writing essays. But the thing is, it's not like the essay like you write for school, like, my summer vacation was really fun. And this guy right here was like, yes, write about your summer vacations. This guy basically says, look, you can have a main topic, and you can develop it throughout a smaller work. You don't need a whole novel. He's the one that, when you think of a persuasive essay or an explanatory essay or whatever, he's the guy that really comes up with that. Uh, so anyway, he advocates tolerance of other people's views, which for the time period is crazy talk. His favorite work is one where, well, of mine. I mean, he didn't have a favorite work of mine. I mean, I had a favorite one of his. But Montaigne writes this book called, of, or essay, called uh, On Cannibals, wherein he talks about cannibals. And you're like, I'm interested. You should be. Because uh, he talks about like how they kill each other and why they eat people and how they prepare the people they eat and all that great stuff. And then he says, but wait a second. Before you get all Judge Judy on these people, maybe you should look at the way we supposedly civilized people are treating people over in the Americas. I don't know if he called it the Americas, but he'd say like the New World and what we call the Native Americans over there. Wherein we have uh, Christians who are forcing these people to convert and sometimes using torture to do it. And really his essay is not about cannibals so much as saying like, hey, 
maybe you shouldn't point fingers when you also are not so civilized, even if you think that you're more civilized than they are because you wear pants. Like, he literally says that. He's a genius. Also, it's got cool stuff about cannibals, so you should enjoy it. Now let's look at some painting. Northern Renaissance painting is not going to be as pious uh, as the literature. I mean, you'll certainly see a lot of pious stuff, but it's not like all over the place like that. Um, it's obsessive in details. Like, you're really going to have weird levels of, of details, and they're going to use a different kind of paints. They're going to use oil paints up there. And you will see the difference, my friends. I know you're waiting right now. You're like, Mr. Oliver, I can't wait to see Northern Renaissance painting. What would we call this painting? Would it be Renaissance painting or what? And the custodian just came in, and he was watching me talk to myself, not realizing I'm recording something. So I don't know if he thinks I'm like rehearsing this for tomorrow because he doesn't know I'm not going to be there. Or does he just think I'm a crazy person? And I like have a like you know lucha libre mask just laying here on my desk like it's a normal thing. And he just kind of looked at me, and then he went on doing his job. He's a good guy. I really wonder what he thinks about me, but I don't want to explain it to him because that ruins the fun. All right, so this is by Quentin Massis or Massis. Uh, it's called the Money Lender and His Wife, and um, by at this time. Uh, we can assume early Renaissance, it's possible for Christians to get into the business, but this could also be a Jewish couple. The crazy thing about this is, look at all of the detail. And I know you look at it first and you're just like, oh, okay, there's a guy and he's got like money or something and there's a lady. But when you get into the details, like look at this, this is like this onyx style stone, not onyx like the Pokemon, this is onyx like the stone. And look at the book here. The little tiny stone has a reflection with heavy levels of detail. Over here, you've got a book with writing that if you had a magnifying glass, you would be able to read. And a picture here. And look, every page is gold leaf and all that. Consider for a moment how small that is. If it's me, I'm lazy. I'd be like, blah, blah, blah. They're like, Quentin Massis is like, dude, I have to have extreme levels of detail. Got all this detail in the back, look there, look at the, the coins, look at the coins here. You can tell what kind of coins there they are if you're into that kind of thing. He's counting them and weighing them. He's got rings, he got pearls, he got like a little, I, got, I think there's a thing for tobacco over here. He's legit. Alright, how about these people? Now, nickname for this picture, ugly people getting married. Okay, I'm not trying to be mean, but these people are not beautiful. But who paid for this? Think about the Renaissance, and think about Renaissance art. Renaissance art is all about people paying to glorify themselves. Okay, this is not about, like, let's glorify our religion. No, no, this is like, this guy was like, whoa, I got here my haughty bride, and I want you all to know and represent and see how rich I am and how awesome I am. A couple of things to stand out. Number one, are they in a church? Various things might point to no. Like, Natchez Gate Ball Science point to no. So, you've got here this feller and this lady. And some people might be going like, she's pregnant. Look at her, she's pregnant. Okay, first of all, you never say that to a lady because you're getting, just trust me on this one, okay? Don't ever say that. Anyway, She's actually not pregnant, many art historians think. But she could be, I guess. But most art historians think she's not. Because it was a custom back in the day, around the 14, 1500s, for a woman to pose for a portrait with a little, like, fake pregnancy pillow that she would wear under her dress on her belly. And this was supposed to ensure fertility in their marriage. In other words, that she'd be able to grant this, this handsome fella right here um, it's some, so a nice big family with lots of sons and all that. Um, but if she is, in fact, pregnant, that points to a different thing that may have been happening before the wedding that I don't want, I don't want to get into, frankly. Anyway, this is their house. Uh, many wealthy people 
had a chapel within their own home. Apparently, the, this family, the Arnold Feeney family, was cool with just having their dog in the picture. So I don't know if the dog was allowed to just wander in or what. It's like, dude, where are your shoes? You got these fancy shoes over here. They're wooden shoes. Mr. Oliver, wooden shoes. Stereotypes of wooden shoes make me think of Dutch people. <laughs> Boom! You got that right. Because Dutch people, Jan van Eck, Northern Renaissance. This is a Dutch painting. What about the levels of detail here? Okay, for context, we're going to look at a close-up of this area right here, okay? Very small in the picture. Almost impossible to see if you're just standing there looking at the picture without a magnifying glass. Here, however, is a magnified version. This is like on the TV shows where they're like, enhance. Mm -hmm. Okay, here, I'll do it. Uh, can you get me this uh, picture back here? Can you um, zoom on that and uh, sharpen it? Right. Okay, check it. You have this mirror, which has uh, stations of the cross or something like that. Okay, so this is like a fancy mirror. And it shows the back of the people who are getting married, as you'd expect, right? It's a mirror. But also the guy that's painting them. Jan van Eck did a self-portrait of himself painting the portrait. That's awesome. And then he goes... Right here, he signs the painting by having it be a signature that says, Jan van Eck was here. That is a dope way to sign your own pictures. Remember, during the Middle Ages, you didn't do that. You didn't sign your own pictures. But, Jan van Eck, he says, hey, yo, we're in the Renaissance now. We do this. All right, one of the things I talked about in class was that Quentin Massis and other painters were really interested in individualism. That is to say, unusual quirks about people. So when they had an unusual subject, they really went for it. This is an unusual subject. It's called the Ugly Duchess. Some people think that Quentin Massis uh, painted this as a joke. You know, like be like, LOL. But other people think that it was a very rare disorder that they uh, put in here as like a, oh, all right, you know, hey, that's certainly unusual. Uh, the Ugly Duchess was not the original title of it. Um, it was originally her name. Nowadays, since she's dead and no one knows her name anymore, um, they just call it the Ugly Duchess. Here, watch this. Let's, let's, hold on. All right, so I wanted you to see uh, the um, this um, this picture here. Uh, it's actually sometimes known as um, a grotesque old woman. Uh, apparently, it is a real disease, and it's an exceptionally rare form of Paget's disease, an abnormality of the metabolism that enlarges and deforms the bones. So if you ever want to go see this, you can go to the National Gallery in London, and you can see apparently it's very, um, very popular. All right, here's another one. Um, this is by Peter Bruegel. And again, look at that name, Bruegel. Not Italian, even if you couldn't tell from the style of painting. But wouldn't you agree that there is a certain style to the north that looks a little bit different than the south? Um, this is uh, the Northern Renaissance style, but also a lot of emphasis on subjects in everyday life, uh, peasants, um, the uh, unusual, uh, people pay, like, you know, counting money and stuff, that could have just been a portrait that they asked for, but this, peasants probably did not. So this is like uh, peasants getting turned, and um, the formal name is the wedding dance, and this is just like peasants being all peasanty, okay? So what are they doing? They're partying, okay? That's what they do. Um, I don't know what to say about this painting because it's got a lot of little jokes in there that I don't really want to get into right now. Uh, another one he did, I like this one better, The Triumph of Death. Uh, this one is uh, very, like, very rough. What is going on in this picture? Well, you've got skeletons with a cart of bones You've got armies coming by, armies over here, 
dead people, people being hanged. That's correct, by the way. Um, dead people all around, cities being terrorized. Couldn't that kind of discuss like what it's like to live in a time of the Black Death and the Hundred Years' War both? I think that's really what he's trying to do there. All right. That's all. Over and out. Um, I want you guys to um, have all these notes. You will turn these in. And uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about Castiglione. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.